Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Mobius conference. My name is Costa, and, and I'm Hannes. And today uh, we would like to talk about testing. We work for a company called Freeletics, and Freeletics is one of the fast, fastest growing sports and lifestyle movement in the world. We are motivating people to become the better version of themselves for six years, and we're proud of it. So today's topic is how to write maintainable tests and how the choice of the architecture could help you with this. So first things first, let's uh, go uh, through the vocabulary and terminology since there are uh, different opinions on different names. And when you think of testing, the first thing is you uh, come to your mind are unit tests. Unit tests are kind of white box tests where you uh, write your like good old objects and you cut them open, you uh, interact with them, and you make sure that the, your interaction leads to the re expected result. Uh, next level would be the integration tests. There are several definitions, and we will stick to the so-called narrow one. So. Integration test is a test when you, where you test the actual connection between component without testing the component itself. Next level uh, is a functional test. Functional test is a type of black box testing uh, where you just feed input to the uh, component and you examine the output. And the top level uh, is end-to-end -end tests. You can think of them as functional tests against a real environment where uh, your, your in, mo in case of mobile development, your application speaks to the real backend, uh, it uses a real database, and it's basically the most production uh, code you will ever test. All those layers are normally aligned uh, into so-called uh, testing pyramid which uh, comes from, I believe, like late 80s, where uh, big groups of smart people were developing a lot of code according to specification in the waterfall approach. So they had their like, paperwork done, they wrote the code, they covered it extensively with unit tests, and then they uh, put uh, integration between those uh, unit, uh, like some other people, put this integration on top of the unit test, and yet another people wrote functional tests. It took them years, but the result was achieved. So this paradigm exists for a long time, and our problem with it, it not really fits a mobile, agile mobile development application. So how often have you been here? It's like you have some unit tests, integration tests are just not good enough, and the whole thing was never tested automatically. Yeah, so uh, if you look on, on uh, if you think of this pyramid again, uh, you may ask yourself, like, why would you write like so many integration and unit tests if functional tests cover the whole scope? So if you ever try this, the answer is pretty easy because it's, it's pretty damn difficult to write a uh, good functional test. They are slow. Uh, it's hard to isolate side effects, and when speaking of side effects, I mean the, like your favorite tracker, your favorite advertisement SDK, like sending your private data to China, uh, like synchronizing the application wherever state, and that's something you don't really want in your automated tests. Next challenge is uh, unreliable and slow layers like network. You just don't want your automation test to fail because of uh, like uh, your network not being responsive enough. And the biggest problem is like every change you make uh, in your code affects and effectively breaks your automated or your functional tests. So that's why the whole concept like of pyramid was like still alive. And but yeah, what if uh, writing the functional test was easier? Would you still do it like in this old school pyramid way, or you would come up with something like this? So I'm proud to present testing mushrooms. Uh, testing mushroom is a concept where we have uh, 
functional tests covering the most of your code, and the integration and unit test level would take care only of the of side effects which you don't want to uh, include in your unit test. To be honest, I googled the name and some other guy came up with this one year ago, so kudos to him. Yeah, uh, so let's speak about like authorities. Uncle Bob once said that uh, you should keep uh, the test code the same way uh, and the same level of quality as uh, the production code. Test code is not throwaway code. So how often did you wrote something like this? I did, and uh, at some point of my life, I was pretty proud of it. That's like, yeah, it's actually, it's, it's cool, it's like espresso, yeah, let's do this. But in fact, it turned out into a horror show, so like maintaining this, like changing every ID was just a bad idea. It's like your whole test is broken and you don't know what's going on. And maintaining test after, uh, after one year was virtually impossible. So if there is one takeaway, uh, we would like you to get from this presentation, it would be it. Write your tests, your mama will be proud of. Uh, yeah, and when we speak about writing the maintainable and uh, scalable uh, automated tests, uh, first of all, functional tests, uh, we, know the, uh, we want to offer you one uh, tool we uh, we like personally, and this tool uh, basically help us to jump on production level test code immediately on every on any level of the application, no matter how much legacy code is this, and it's called Robot Pattern. So long story short, uh, some years ago uh, Martin Fowler was popularizing the page object pattern for web uh, testing. Uh, which was, in a nutshell, the concept is where instead of like asserting the specific view items, you are writing the uh, object. In case of Selenium, I think it was JavaScript object, which describes a piece of uh, the view where you can do the interactions with the view and where you can assert the uh, the results in way more readable way. And the robot pattern is basically is like piggybacks on the Kotlin DSL syntax, uh, which makes the same concept much more readable and much more uh, fun to maintain. So let's go through key principles. That would be let robot do whatever user can do and let robot verify what user can see. So that's our uh, test app. And it doesn't work, so we just jump through. Uh, so uh, the app is basically the to-do list where we are able to see the list of items where we click on create item, where we uh, have a wizard uh, type of screen. We type the thing, we type the to-do item name, and then we can see it back in the list. So that will be our test. Uh, we would like to write in the robot pattern style. This uh, would be as simple as this. So you can see this to-do list. Think it's our robot, it's our uh, object which uh, knows how to interact with this very particular screen. So click create to the items would basically do the user interaction to so click an item, then we go to another screen which is described by, di by a different robot, by a different object, which also knows how the screen looks. And it knows how to interact with this. We enter stuff, we click buttons, and we press save, and we see the, see the result. So that's basically how the same test I showed you before looks using the robot pattern. Uh, one of the uh, key advantages of the robot pattern, you don't have to change the test every time the flow, uh, when the flow doesn't change. It's fun to read, and it's pretty easy to extend. So if you think of the robot as a part of implementation, not as a part of the test, it's just like part of your like, business to maintain it, and it's also way more uh, easy to refactor and way more easy to, to read again. But there are some downsides. Yeah, let's talk about downsides, or rather call it things the robot pattern is not that opinionated about, or things that are not necessarily exactly in the scope of the robot pattern per se. So I'm talking about things like which application state is 
the application set up when we start running a test. I'm talking about assertions and verifications. So as you, said, as you have seen before, the example Kostya gave, there was something like, I press button, I enter text, and the verifications were inside this function called press button somehow. And it was mainly by doing something like using Espresso to access a view, and if the view is not there, then the test will fail. This is kind of the assertions we have with this uh, functional test by using the traditional robot pattern. And I don't know about you, but I believe that tests should be something like a specification. And if you just look at the example that we have, sh have uh, shown before, it kind of gives you some sense what the user can do, but it's not like a full readable specification of what is actually going on in your app, right? So what if we would start with a vision in mind, something that we would like to have at the end of the day? Something that my mama would be feel proud of. And with that in mind, let's take the steps to get there. Or in other words, let's choose our architecture to complete this vision. And we will see how we will get there. So back to our example. What we had is like adding a new uh, item to the to-do list. But now, instead of just getting the, um, the actions that the user can do, we would also have something like specifications so that our test reads more like a documentation of the screen, okay? So first, we would like to add something like a given block around this robot pattern. And now we can see in which state the robot starts, okay? We start, for example, with this pre-filled to-do list items. In our case, an empty list, for example. Next, we assert that there is a loading state. So imagine you have to write this to-do li to list application. It will fetch some data asynchronously, maybe from the local database. But it's still something that is asynchronously, and you probably would like to, to show a spinner in the meantime, a progress bar, whatever, right? And to make this thing a little bit more readable, we could use some Kotlin language features, like we could use the property and overwrite the getter, or rather misuse this, this idea of properties. And by the way, if you ever thought like value val in Kotlin means like immutable on a private uh, or a private field or something like that inside your class, it's not the case because you can always override together and return any arbitrary value. So whenever you call this property, you could give a different value all the time. And we are misusing this in, in this example. So the next thing is once like the data has been loaded, we would like to display the list. Okay. And again, this is the vision. We would like to have this at the end. Because now we have like the separation of assertions and events that the user can trigger. For example, now we have click create to do item. And one convention that we found useful to follow is we use functions, so you see also the brackets, for things that the user can input. Whereas we use like this or misuse this value um, without the brackets to access it for state verification, so to speak. Next, we have this create item as before. And also, this create item not only has this enter title thing, but it, we also have to assert are we actually into that state of showing this wizard first screen where user can insert the title now. Next, we press the next button as we did before. We have done the summary button where we see something like, OK, would you like to create this item now with that title? And then you would call save. And at the end, something that you would also have to show is like a loading indicator, because you would like to save this in the database, which is, again, something like an asynchronous call that would require the UI to show some progress indicator or whatever. right? And at the end, you would also have to verify that this was successful somehow. In our example app, it would mean navigate back to the previous screen, which is then the list of all items. And to make this thing very fluent, we would assume OK, the content state, which means like the list of items plus this new item that we would like to add. All right? So this reads like much more now like a specification of what is actually going on inside your app rather than just this rough idea of what the robot pattern does. But you still use the strengths of the robot pattern, like abstracting away this espresso calls inside some nice DSL, and we leverage some Kotlin features to build something like that. So far, so good. Reads like a specification now. Another example would be um, 
to mark an, an item in that list as done or as not done. So for example, we, could, or we can use the exact same robot to do that. That's also one part of the robot. So you don't have to write your tests over and over again, but you have one robot uh, object or one ob uh, robot class that you can reuse through different test cases. So in our case, we start with a not empty list this time, but with two items already in that list. And the first item is not checked, okay? So what we do now is we do a same, the same assertion. So we assert we are in this empty state, and uh, this loading state, but instead of an empty list, we now already assume that there is like a content state which contains these two items. Then we will click on the first item, which would result in something like assert that the first so, uh, item is checked or marked as checked. Then we click again on this item and we assume that the item is not checked anymore. Reads like a specification, right? Or yet another example, we could do some fancy and like if you have this wizard to create like a new item, we could already seed some initial state into the configuration and directly jump to a certain state. Or at least that is what we would like to have. Again, this is the vision, but we will, we will talk about how we get there. And we could assume something like, if I am in the summary state, where I see something like, would you like to create this item? And if I go, uh, if I press the back button, then I'm back to the edit, or like create a new item where I can change the title. If I press next, then I'm again on the summary screen. This, this is kind of things we can do now easily with such a nice, convenient DSL. And as I said before, I guess, I am really proud of reading something like that. My coworkers will be really proud of reading and writing something like that. And my mom will be proud of that too. Moreover, she could read that, which kind of gives her some context what I'm actually doing all day instead of just fixing some Windows uh, issues she has whenever her, window, her Windows PC doesn't work anymore. Um, so now let's focus on how, right? So this all sounds good, and this is a nice vision, but how do we get there? How do we make these things happen? So there are th a certain things to consider, and this is where the architecture comes in. So one thing that our architecture should be taken into account is there must be a single source of truth, and this single source of truth should be somewhere in the business logic. And this leads to the conclusion we should something have, have something like state machines inside the business logic. Then the UI basically just renders the state. So something like Redux or MVI or some, something like that, just to give you some, some first impression. Furthermore, we need something like Atomic UI updates. So if you think about, for example, the MVP pattern, you have something in your presenter like uh, view.showloading, view.show this input field, view.show something, and this is not Atomic because you have to call that and that and that. Whereas where you have a UI that only gets a render state or only pro exposes a render state function, and you pass the whole state, this is atomic. Every time you pass a new state, everything will change at once inside your UI. And it's push, not pull based. There is nothing inside, or there should nothing be inside your fragment, activity, whatever, something like fragment on resume, where you say something, uh, okay, give me the current state so I can render it. It's the, it's the other way around. It's like the business logic who is pushing states whenever the state changes to the UI, so the UI is pretty dumb and just renders whatever the layer below tell the view the state is. Also, this has a nice side effect that for writing tests, we actually don't need things like idling resources, but we will, we will talk about that in a second. So overall, let's take a look at the architecture of the simple screen of um, um, showing a to-do list, or the list of all items inside your to-do list. And let's start at the bottom. Let's use this free layer architecture where we have this data access layer. We have application, business logic layer, and presentation layer. And let's walk step by step quickly through it to just give you a better idea of what I mean when I'm talking about architecture and how it relates to testing. So inside the data access layer, we could have something like a to-do repository. And the to-do repository is pretty straightforward. It just has a get all, it has an add, it has an update. So really expressive, really convenient to read and deal with. So it's, not, it's also not doing something, or it's not meant to do something like, I have a repository, and inside this implementation, I check whether I should go to the network layer or to the local database if I support something like offline. That's not what should be here on that layer. Here we are really talking about the raw access to the data, like 
making SQL queries, something like that. Orchestrating those stuff, this is more like inside the business logic. But in our example, we only stick with the idea of having a local database, SQLite database on your device and not making some HTTP requests. But I, get, I guess you get the point how it could look like if you have to add something like that. So the next thing is the state machine. So the state machine, let's, have, let's say we have this to-do list state machine. This is kind of the business logic uh, layer. And this is where state management should happen. It should not happen inside your recycler view, inside the view holder of an adapter. It should not happen somewhere in the fragment. It should not happen somewhere uh, layers below in the database. It's really that thing that manages all the state. And how it could look like is something like that. So I really would like to focus on the public API that this thing exposes. Something like a state and something like input. And without going too much into the details, State could look something like that. So we have the loading state, which means at the end showing like a progress bar while starting fetching the database or querying the database. We could have something like a content state, which means here is the list of items to display as content inside your app. Or we could have an error state if something, something fails while fetching your data. And with RxJava, but it's not really talk about RxJava, it could look something like that. So you would... Um, Get the, query, get the result from the query, you would map it inside the content state. In case of an error, you would map it inside an error state. And, in case, or, and even before doing the query, you would start with a show loading state, so to speak. But this is more like an implementation detail, not part of this talk. And similar with actions, so we could have something like a to-do action, which could represent something like, I have marked something as done, or I would like to toggle something as done or I could have something like I would delete the entire item, and this would be handled in this input thing, and again, the implementation details are not that interesting. But what is interesting is it only kind of interacts with the layer below, and there are no variables or side effects stored inside this business logic thing. We will get to back to that later. Next, the list view model could, we could use, or we are going to use the um, architecture components view model. It's pretty straightforward. It, just gets the state machine as a constructor, and all it does is basically connecting to it and keeping the subscription alive during, during um, orientation changes. So it just forwards the inputs, and it gets the state from the state machine and puts it inside the alive data so that it's easier to deal with, with unsubscribing and um, orientation changes with the fragment and so on. So, if you squeeze in I, your eyes enough, you could potentially say that view model and the business logic, they are pure functions. So, I know as a, if you are a functional programmer, you would disagree because it's not exactly like that. For example, live data stores some state internally. But from a very high-level perspective, we could assume that it is pure function. And this gives us the benefits of every single function is easy testable in a unit test. But as Kostya mentioned before, What's the point of testing everything individually if we already know that this will behave always the same because it has no side effects inside, it's a pure function? What's the point comparing or writing unit tests instead of writing functional tests that covers those things uh, too? Because, as I said before, we don't have to run that in isolation. They, they are fu pure functions, they behave always the same. Um, let's add the fragment to this so that we have like the full picture. And as you spot, it's pretty short class, right? There is nothing like find view by ID in it. So, but there is another strange thing, this view binder, and I will talk about it in a minute what it is. But I would like to quote uh, one of my coworkers, Gabriel, who said like, an activity or a fragment should only have the responsibility it has to have. Nothing more, nothing less. So it means like, is dealing with UI necessarily the responsibility of the UI, uh, of the fragment? Yeah, not necessarily. It, I mean, from the, from the API, it offers a lot of things that you can do. But should you do that? Probably not. So all this fragment does is it connects to the view model to observe the state and forward it. And it also goes the other way around. So for user interaction, it forwards or delegates those user interaction to the view model. What you get or hope to get is out of this picture is clear separation of concerns, single responsibilities. So now let's talk about this view binder to complete this picture. 
it looks like a lot of code. You immediately spot like, now there are this fine view by ID stuff. But let's focus on the core principles, which is it exposes only two methods. So all the interfaces of all the components we have talked about looks really self-explaining, right? And the same is here. So you have a random method, you get the state, and the state would, manage the, uh, would change the UI, you would set some visibility properties, run some animations, whatever. That's inside this random method. And the other way around, you can add a listener, which in our case would be uh, the fragment who connects it to the view model to kind of get some actions whenever the user clicks, for example, on a button, it will trigger an action. All right. So now let's talk about, or now let's come back to testing. So we have this vision in mind of this nice DSL. How can we achieve that? So on the right side, we have this robot. And in the column in the middle, this is like the dots where we have to connect our test somehow with our application code. And as I said before, this is kind of the pure function. So how do we connect the robot to certain things? And the first thing is like this given block, this configuration, where we would like to pre-manipulate the state or pre-manipulate the environment where the test should start with. So how should this look like? So what we could do is we could use Mokito or any other mocking tool to mock this repository, right? So we would have something like in any arbitrary test where we use Mokito, we would call mokito.mock to do repository when we set some specification, and maybe we even have some verification. And we would do that for our second test as well, and for a lot of other tests. So we basically are going to repeat us over and over again, right? But we would like to write maintainable and scalable tests at the end with this vision that we have in our mind with this robot pattern. And now we're talking about the foundation. And if our foundation looks like this, boy, that's not scalable, believe me. We tried it. So Mokito, or mocking in general, not good. So what instead? I mean, not good is a bit too harsh. Maybe there are some places where you would l like, or where there is no other way around to use Mokito, especially when you deal with classes that you are not in control, things like, android.view.view or something like that where you really have to mock it because there's no real easy way around it. But if you're talking about components like this to-do repository or something like that, you better write test implementations or fakes or stops or whatever the proper name is. I would like to stick with the name test implementation instead of using Mokito or some mocking tools. This has two advantages. So the first advantage we already see, it's reusable. So you have like your test implementation of this repository, and you can use it in every single ex uh, test, instead of having to repeat all this mokito.mock and when blah, 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 then blah, blah, blah thing all the time, as I've shown you before. And the next thing, it's also refactorable now. So imagine you would like to change, like you have, an ex have already written some tests with using mokito, and if you would like to change now just a single behavior of something, most likely you would have to go in all, every single place where you have used Mokito or something and change that behavior in every single test to get to the proper behavior. Whereas if you have like a fake implementation or a test implementation, there is one single place where you change it and it's done for all of your tests. Okay, so let's assume we have something like an in-memory to-do repository or a test implementation to-do repository, something like that. How do we connect it now with the configuration? And this is where like, this given block before now comes in. And without going too much into the details, because I think it's not that interesting, the code could look something like that. You don't have to read it, it's a lot of code. I just want to highlight what is important, so they have like this given at the beginning, which shows, um, which is kind of the entry point, and with this Kotlin DSL stuff, you can make then some config class run, and what it basically does is it reads the preferred to-do item. So if you go back to that uh, underlined thing here, preferred to-do item, that's actually the variable here in the middle of the screen. And you basically just write those things to the data, and then you start your real test. And then you start the robot doing the work. All right, so back to our picture. What is missing now is, or what we're trying to do here is we are trying to write functional tests. So we would like to run as much production code as we can. And as I said before, this thing in the middle are basically pure functions, so there is nothing that we have to mock or to have to replace with some fake implementations. 
the layer below is something where we have to replace it with a fake implementation to be in full control and make things more convenient to work with. And yeah, just to make it under our control instead of having to elaborate out how some devices behave and so on. Um, what is missing now is how do we get to this assertions of states or how we get into this assertions in general, right? So let's focus on that part now. So the road pattern is pretty straightforward for simple things like triggering an input. I think calling something like espresso on view, click something is um, not a big deal. Um, nothing that is super interesting. What is more interesting is this assertion things, right? So I showed you before this view binder. What if we could replace this view binder while running our test with a list enabled view binder? And what it gives us is, um, sorry, is something like a listener that we can call whenever we call render. So we are actually still calling the real view binder, but we also kind of not defining something whenever we get a new state to render or whenever we have done rendering a new state. And this gives us a lot of power because this is exactly the entry point where we can get some control over the Android UI. We could, uh, for example, add some on pre draw listener on a view to make sure that we only notify the listener once the UI is actually drawn on the screen or things like that, that otherwise would require idling resources, espresso, or some other workarounds, and in worst case, some thread.sleep, which I don't recommend, by the way, to use, of course. Um, so who is kind of the listener to that? That's now the next question, right? So basically, it's a robot. A robot would basically have something like a state history, which is a list of states that got rendered over time. And whenever like the view binder gets uh, a new state to render, it renders it on the screen, plus it notifies our robot, hey, here is a new, a new state. Next, how can we assert things would be as easy as assert states and get a list of states and, and check if it's like the history that we got from the view, view binder is what we would expect to have on the screen. However, what we would like to have is this DSL. What we actually have is something like that. There are three issues with that. So first, you kind of just believe me that we need the whole history. So nice, nice audience here today, I love that, so I don't have to explain it, but we will elaborate on it. Because the second point is, this is not that nice to read and to write, because whenever you add a new, like something, you have to go again through all the tests and as change like the parameters in these asset states. So this is actually the problem, or this problem was actually already solved by the robot pattern. And the third thing is, the tests are actually running on a different thread, right? And I told you before that we don't necessarily have to use idling resources if we get our architecture properly, if it's push-based rather than pull-based. So those three issues we still have to elaborate, and that's what we're going to do now. So first, let's, for example, take a look at this robot, which is exactly the same thing. But have you noticed that at the end we are asserting that two states are there? And now I'm going to show you again the video. Well, not again, because it didn't work before. But I'm going to show you a video what happens on the UI if you click on the save, on the, in the, on the save item button. If it's working. No, it's not. But what you would see in that video is uh, the summary screen, where it shows, like, would you like to create the item? And you would press yes, save it. And then you kind of navigate back to the previous screen, which shows the list of items, including the new one that you have created. But there was never really shown a progress indicator on the screen, because on that particular device, the query, or this S, uh, not the query, but inserting it into the database was super fast, and it ran without having to render it, actually, because the UI already transitioned to the, to the previous screen. So this has two problems. First, it kind of adds flakiness to your test. Because on some devices it's there, on some devices it's not there. How do you deal with that inside your test? I mean, Espresso got better over time and probably also deals nowadays with some edge cases. But in a proper architecture, this should not be an issue at all. 
This is the reason why we need like a full history of our states, because now we can not only check, like if you go back, now we can not only check if the saving successful state has been reached after I press the save, but we can also assert, assert that we have also had this successful state in between. Okay, so how would we do that? Um, and, the first, and the third thing to address is, like what I mentioned before, the tests are actually running on a different thread than um, your actual UI and so on. And we also don't have to replace any background schedulers if you do it right, or if you get the architecture right. So instead of um, having something like a list of state, we could use RxJava because it just adds some convenient method for us, but I will, I will explain you the main idea behind it. So instead of saving it into a list, we're saving it into a replay um, relay, which means all the items are inserted to that, and whenever I call something that um, subscribes to this relay, I get like the whole list, every item inserted one by one or emitted one by one. And what, it, what um, Uncle Bob said before is like, don't treat your tests um, like the test code as a code that you throw away, so let's also apply some good practices here. So instead of putting everything in, inside the robot, which will end up in a God robot, and we had like this God activity, or an IS, this God uh, UI controllers, or view controllers, let's create another class called state verifier for it, which single responsibility is like to deal with the state history. And how it will look like, it gets this replay subject, and uh, bear with me, I will explain in a minute the main idea behind this replay subject, or um, relay, which is the uh, same thing to the, to the subject, we would have something like an asset next state, and we just pass in the next state that we should have. Now, we also keep track of some kind of lists of state that we have already verified. And our expected state is actually the already verified state plus the new state that we would, like, that we would expect, right? So far, so good. So now coming back to this um, re replay relay trick, and just to get you an idea of what I mean with the overall, what, what's the overall idea is, and you can exchange it with your own implementation if you're not in favor of Rx Java, you could do something like, from this state observable, take um, the numbers of items that I am aware in my history, plus one, because this new one state that I'm expecting, right? What Rx Java is doing, like, in your history, let's assume in your history you have five items. And now we would, ex would expect that the sixth item is the next one to come. What Rx Java does in that case, or this replay does, is it waits until the sixth element comes. And we give it a timeout in case it takes longer than 10 seconds. Probably something is wrong in your code or something like that. So we would not wait forever. So we add an, a timeout here. And since every item is submitted uh, individually, we then group it into a list, and we say blocking get. And this blocking get is kind of the replacement for the, uh, for the idling resources. So now we can make our test thread, who runs this um, code, wait until we have these six items, or until the timeout happens. Which in case of timeout would mean the test should fail. And at the end, it's basically just comparing the expected list of states with the actual list of states at the end. And yeah, we would save the already verified uh, um, list or update the already verified list with the current list. So this is kind of the picture how it looks like at the end. And what we did here is we only have replaced something in the bottom layer, which is the layer that has side effects, and in the layer on top, which is also the layer that interacts with the AI, which has some side effects. Everything in between is something that we are totally under control, and in best case, is based on pure function and single responsibilities, principles, and so on, so that you can write a functional test that cover all those things easily instead of having to write unit tests individually. Back to our example, so we are still not fully there. So we would like to have this DSL, we are still not fully there yet. So there's one little trick to add is asset loading state, we use this or misuse this property access and overwrite the getter. And what we can do now is state verifier, asset next state, and the expected state, which would be loading state. Similar for state with empty list, and I guess you get the idea. 
Yeah, but uh, can we do the verification better uh, than just using Espresso? For instance, uh, we have the power of state machine, so we're totally in control of what our app is actually doing. So why bother using Espresso? Why bother using this like lagging technology? Uh, what we can do instead is having the screenshot uh, testing. Uh, for instance, if you use a Facebook library, we can go for uh, we can introduce our own binder for actual UI tests and make the screenshot of the uh, current screen and compare it with the one pre-recorded. There are several opportunities we can compare either images or have a snapshot of the view hierarchy and compare the text form, which gives you a bit more insights afterwards. So if we get rid of uh, uh, of UI, uh, like Espresso completely in our UI test, we can uh, go one step further and make all our, uh, all our tests, uh, all our robots uh, to use uh, head, so-called headless view binders so they won't render anything, and they would run like in complete GVM environment. So we basically uh, throw away the Android uh, view part out of it, and we have separate test, uh, fast test suite for uh, testing the functionality, and we have the other one for checking that user actually is able to see what we want user to see. Which brings us to the next level uh, of uh, advantages, which would be like localization Q, uh, QA. We have like, our app is localized for uh, in nine languages, and there is a constant process of verification of translation. Uh, all this text should make sense, not only as a single sentence, but in context, and everything should fit properly, which is which which is kind of a challenge sometimes. So it took us quite a long time to uh, do it manually, and we ended up with an automated solution. So the robots are run without any assertions. Uh, they just nav uh, we use robots just to navigate through the app, and the custom view binder uh, uses uh, the screenshots to capture the text in the uh, necessary languages, and we just export them. And yeah, there is one manual step. You have to send it back to the local uh, local localization team, but that's pretty much it. It takes no time, and the results are pretty fantastic. So I think now we have a short time for a few questions, and then we will wrap it up.